Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to our sit-ups, our spiritual impact training using prayer and scripture. I am Pastor Tony Burke Brown coming with our spiritual nourishment, our spiritual word for today. Get your Bibles, get your pen, get your paper. We are going to do one more recap of Genesis unless you guys send me some notes of some other things that you need to recap before we go into Exodus. I'm doing this word for our end of the week to finish up the book of Genesis with um, a couple of notes that I wanted to uh, point out. But then next week we are starting in the book of Exodus. So I want you to get your materials together. You know what we do. We're going to go into these scriptures and then you're going to go back and study for yourself. You're going to go back and get this word on the inside and allow the Holy Spirit to continue to teach you, to pour into you so that you are growing, changing, progressing and being impacted by the word so we can impact the world. We're supposed to be making a difference. This is spiritual impact training using prayer and scripture prayer and scripture these are weapons these are tools this is armor this is what we need in order for us to walk as overcomers and be all that god purposed us to be and to draw nearer to him and so we are looking at some recaps in genesis i'm gonna ask you to turn to genesis chapter three father in the name of jesus lord god we ask that your holy spirit take over as our teacher lord that you would pour into us this word this bread of life lord god the living water that we're on overflow never to be the same we thank you that you're transforming us changing us renewing our minds as we meditate on your word i thank you Lord God, for the transformation. I thank you, Lord God, for the cleansing, the purification. We thank you, Lord God, for continuing the good work you began in us until Christ Jesus. So, Father, we rejoice in you. We bless your name. We honor you for who you are. We thank you for all that you've done and all that you're doing and all that you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen to God be the glory. Genesis chapter 3. I just want to point out a few verses in the Old Testament and the New Testament, because what I want us to see is, um, for those of you that have been connected already with the sit-ups, you know that this includes our morning prayer Monday through Friday. That information is underneath if you've not been a part of that. Also, a Wednesday night spiritual warfare class that's on Facebook Live, uh, Instagram Live, and the phone line, um, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Wednesday evenings. So one of the things that we do go over is spiritual warfare. And so what I want to look at today is the fact that as we look at spiritual warfare and as we're looking at um, the um, fighting against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And I want us to see how that was in the beginning. This is not just a New Testament thing. This is part of our walk. This is part of us being in the world. It's that we have to acknowledge that we are in a battle. Not something that we can uh, fight with fists and with knives and guns. And Our weapons are, are spiritual, right? And it comes from obedience and submission to God and walking in His uh, in his word. So we're looking at Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Because I first want to look at this battle that we have um, against the devil. The devil is real. There is an enemy that is wanting to take us out of or keep us out of or bring us back out of the will of God. And so it is to blind the minds of unbelievers so they won't know. It is to try to pull people back after they've been walking with God with lies, false doctrines, false teachers. It is to, to uh, you know, to, to cause people to be bound, to be lost, headed for destruction. That is what the enemy wants. He's in competition, he thinks, with God. 
The devil and his demons are real. So we're going to look right in the beginning when everything was good. For Adam and Eve, everything was good. They're in the garden. God himself said everything was good and very good. So they had everything that they needed and they had dominion over every living thing. Here they are. What else do they want? There's only one limitation. There's one stipulation. There's one thing that they're told not to do. We remember that they're not supposed to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But when we look in chapter 3, we covered this, that it tells us about this serpent, right? And it says in verse 1, the serpent was more subtle than any beast in the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And it tells us, it goes on to say that the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but... Of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And that begins, that is the conversation that takes place when the devil, the serpent, begins to tell her that um, God knows that in the day that you eat there of your eyes will be open, you'll be as gods and no good and evil. So the woman looks at it, she sees it's good for food, it's pleasant to her eyes, it's a tree to be desired, uh, to make one wise. So she is desiring, right? She is desiring um, what the enemy is placing before her. So this is part of our battle. When you think about the things that we're exposed to in the world, the things that are around us, that the enemy can use to entice us if we have that desire on the inside, right? She had a desire on the inside to have more than what God had already provided. And he had already given them everything, including dominion. He had supplied their needs. Everything they needed was in the garden because God's presence was in the garden. God, God had given them um, food. He had given them, you know, the animals. He had given them everything and everything was good. There was nothing lacking in their life because God was providing everything that they needed. But when we keep desiring more and more and more, when we keep uh, you know, looking around us and desiring forbidden things that we know are against the will of God. It gives an opening to the devil. We know Ephesians 4 says, give no place to the devil. So we need to shut every door. So what we're looking at is um, the scripture in 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. I'm just connecting a few verses of scripture. This is the one where we're looking at that we actually have an enemy. The enemy was right there, right there with Adam and Eve and took them out of the will of God. That was the fall of man. That is our whole problem right now is that the serpent talked to Eve and she listened to the enemy. We have a warfare from the beginning. Don't let people tell you that there is no battle. Don't let people have you trying to fight in your flesh you have to know what god says eve's weapon was the word all she had to do was just do what god said not do it what god told her not to do what he told adam she knew what the word was she knew they were not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when we know the truth the word of god and we refuse to obey it there's the enemy he's waiting He's lurking. He's trying to get us to disregard what God says. So when you look in uh, 1 Peter, again, we are in chapter 5, verse 8. I'm going to read the King James first. And the King James simply says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. That's what he does. So what are we to be sober? Be vigilant. We have to be aware. We have to watch. We have to pray. We have to praise. We have to, we have to speak the word. We have to stay in the word. We have to remind ourselves what the word says. We have to lean on the spirit of God. Abide in Christ. We have to be positioned. We have to stay in the presence of God. We're praying. We're praising. We're preaching. We're speaking the word. Confessing it. Living it. Applying it. We have to stay connected to God. We're not listening to false teachings, false doctrines. I've said over and over again, when somebody is telling you something, oh, the Lord said it's your season. I declare that you're going to be rich. I declare today that God is about to pour something out. Just type amen at the, at the bottom. Ask people, where's the scripture? Where, where is that at? 
Stop believing anything that you hear. Don't listen to things because they sound good. It will take you out of the will of God. It makes you put down your spiritual weapon, which is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It makes you put down God's word so that you can receive something for itching ears, something that sounds good, that's not biblical, it's not spirit-filled, it's not what God said, it's what someone told you that sounds good. So Eve began to see it different. But the Bible tells us to be clear-minded and alert. We have an opponent, we have an adversary, the devil. He is our enemy, and he goes around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to eat up. Somebody to devour, somebody to, uh, to, to take over, somebody to consume, okay? So now, go back to Genesis, go to chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, again, we're fighting against the devil, our flesh, and the world. That's the spiritual battle. It's not always the devil. Sometimes it's our flesh. It's what's on the inside because Actually, the devil can tempt us for what is on the inside. That desire, if you got pride and you want to be elevated, lifted up and praised, he will show you opportunities to do things out of the will of God so that people will appear to celebrate you. You know, and so the flesh is where we're at. We're going to Genesis chapter four, Genesis chapter four. And in Genesis chapter four, we're reminded of Cain and Abel, Cain and Abel. I know you remember. So in, in Genesis chapter 4, it starts off telling us how Adam and Eve, you know, they, they came together, they conceived Cain. And then um, it tells us that then she had Abel in, chapter, in verse 2. And so now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. But then it goes on and tells us that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock. And of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. So in other words, they both offered an offering. God accepted Abel's, but he didn't accept Cain's. So now this is the part of the flesh. Our flesh wants to be acknowledged, wants to be recognized. Our flesh wants to be promoted. Our flesh wants to have what somebody else has. Our flesh desires worldly things, desires uh, promotion, desires fame, desires recognition, right? Attention. Um, so here we have Abel's accepted, Cain's not. So what happens is, if we remember correctly, Cain had a little bit of an attitude. It tells us that Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. He was angry. And God addresses it. Why are you wroth? Why is your countenance falling? That's what he asked him in verse 6. He tells him, if you do well, won't you be accepted? If you don't do well, sin lies at your door. And unto thee shall be his desire and thou shalt have rule over him. So he tells him, listen, do the right thing. You'll be accepted. This was his opportunity to do the right thing and say, God, what is it that I can do to make my offering accepted? What is going on? Is it my attitude? Is it the actual offering? Is it that I did it with the wrong intentions? That I did it out of pride? I did it out of competition with my brother? What is it? What do I need to do right in order for me to be accepted? Because God said, if you do what's right, won't you be accepted? But if not, sin lies at your door. It wants to have you, but you got to master it. So he has a choice here. He can do what's right and get the acceptance from God or he can refuse it and be angry and be jealous and follow after his what? His flesh. His fleshly desires. His flesh makes him angry. His flesh makes him jealous. His flesh is going to want to react and get able. He's been warned and he's been instructed by God himself. He has an opportunity to do the right thing, just as we have the opportunity. We have God's word. We have God's spirit. We, we have an opportunity to do the right thing. God always gives us a way of escape for every temptation, it tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And we have that opportunity, right, to do the right thing. But Cain didn't take that opportunity. He was angry, he set his brother up, and he killed him. And there was punishment for that. 
He didn't try to subdue his flesh. He didn't bring it under subjection. He didn't yield to God's word. Again, the word of God is the sword of the spirit. It tells us in Ephesians chapter six, right? That is one of our weapons. It's a weapon of mass destruction. Eve could have used the word and she would have overcame the serpent's temptation. She just could have kept saying what God said and not entertain the enemy. Cain could have done what God said. And he could have found out what was right and done what was acceptable. And he wouldn't have killed his brother. And then he wouldn't have been put out there and punished for his sin. But he didn't do it. Instead, he killed his brother. And there was consequences for that. So let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. 1 Peter 2 and 11. Write these verses down. This is the same battle that we have. There's no temptation that's common unto man. It, it, it's everything that we go through that we face, it's already happened. It's already been in the past. This is not something new. You're not the only one going through it. Not the only one suffering through it. But there's always a way out. But we have to understand the battle in order for us to be the overcomer. And so it tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, in the King James, it says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. This is the flesh. So what this is telling us, when you look in the NLT, it says, Dear friends, I warn you, as temporary residents and foreigners, to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. So now... We have to abstain from sinful desires. This is putting the flesh down. We have to be led by the spirit. The Bible says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The Bible tells us if we walk after the spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So we have to make a decision. How do we put this flesh down? How do we stop the flesh from overtaking us? How do we stop following after the flesh that leads to destruction? We begin to walk after the spirit. We begin to follow what God says. We begin to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit who reminds us of the word that we've heard. Reminds us of God's instructions, his commands. The Holy Spirit helps us, aids us, empowers us so that we are able to overcome. So we can say no to the things that we used to say yes to. That we can choose. If we're going to choose the, the, to walk in the Spirit, in life, so to the Spirit, right? Right? And have eternal life, relationship with God. Be overcomers, more than conquerors, because we're following after the Spirit. Every time we follow after the Spirit, we're mortifying the deeds of the body. We're saying no to the body. If, you, if you're tempted to tell a lie because you don't want somebody to know what you did because your flesh is like, I don't want them to know I've been through that. I don't know, want them to know I did that. I don't want them to know I experienced that. So your flesh and pride is saying saying tell a lie tell them no tell them you didn't do it tell them you didn't go through that tell them you never experienced that you want to tell a lie it's your flesh but the spirit of god says speak the truth right that the devil is the father of lies right so as you remember that you begin to speak the truth just speaking the truth because you're led by the spirit mortifies the deeds of the body you shut your flesh down by doing what the spirit of god reminded you enabled you empowered you to do so we have to fight the bible says that the spirit and the flesh war against one another They're contrary one to another you're in a constant battle between the flesh and the spirit and the only way to win over the flesh is to follow after the spirit to be led by the spirit the bible says those that are led by the spirit of god are sons of god so now then we get to chapter 6. Go to chapter 6. This is the last one. This is the world because we're fighting against the enemy, the flesh, and the world. This is spiritual battle. But it was back in Genesis. That's the only reason why I want to cover this is because we go through this in the spiritual warfare class. But we need to know this ain't nothing new. The things that we go through ain't something new, right? There ain't nothing new under the sun. Everything that you face that you're struggling through, somebody else already did. And you say, well, 
Did they fail at it? You know, it's hard. Just because they did it doesn't mean blah, blah, blah. But look at this. We're going to look at Noah. We're going to look in Genesis chapter 6. We're reminded in Genesis chapter 6 when God looked around and he was just basically disgusted at what was going on. And the Bible tells us in verse 3 of chapter 6, I'm not going through everything because we already went through these chapters. So if you missed them, you can go back and check on the YouTube channel and get back to those chapters and study those. But it tells us in verse 3, the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. The Bible tells us in verse 5, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repents me that I made him. He is, he is, listen, he's looking around. Everything is evil. The thoughts of man are wicked and evil continuously, just like now. People are wanting to do what seems right in their own mind. They're following after the flesh, the carnal mind, doing whatever they desire. All kinds of ungodly relationships, conversation, division, murder, strife, you know, confusion, hatred, wars, everything. All just evil, just greedy, just prideful, just haughty, just rebellious. You got witchcraft, you got drugs, you got, you know, all types of things all around. And people are seeking after the things of the world, desiring the things of the world. And that cannot be our excuse. Because after that, it says, and Noah, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He had favor with God because the Bible tells us in verse nine, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. So as it's telling us, in verse 11, the earth was also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence just like it is now, right? But it tells us that Noah found grace in his sight. How did he do that? Because the Bible says he was a just man and perfect in his generations. He walked with God. He walked with God while there was violence, while there was corrupt behavior, while there was wickedness and evil. It was around him. He was in the midst of it. He's the only one that found grace in the sight of the Lord. So that means everything and everybody around him was corrupt and wicked and evil, ungodly thoughts, but he still managed to walk with God. Our excuse is not, I can't help, but everybody's doing it. The excuse is not, you know, it's all around me and, you know, and I can't help it. And they started it and they made me sin and they made me cuss them out and they made me commit this crime. And, you know, and, and, and all of these, no, no, you can find grace in the sight of the Lord. God. It's looking for those that will walk with him in spite of. That we don't love the things of the world. We're not seeking the things that the world is seeking. We're not chasing after what they're chasing after. In Romans, it tells us in chapter 12, not to be conformed to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're here, but we don't belong here. We're passing through the last verse that we read. Um, and Peter was talking about sojourners, pilgrims. Listen, we here, but we passing through. Our home is heaven bound. We are heaven bound. Our home is with the Lord. And so now, for this one, we are going to 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Because this is the world we're fighting against. The enemy, the flesh, and the world. Nothing new. This is back in Genesis. And so we're reminded in, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all this in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. The will of God is his word. When we walk in his word, again, for every one of them, the enemy, the flesh, and the world, the answer is the word. Do what God says. Follow his instruction, his commands. From the beginning, that was the problem. It was rebelling against God's instruction. That's what caused Eve and Adam to sin. That's what caused Cain to sin. That is why the world was so wicked and evil. Because it was doing what was right in its own mind. That's what's going on right now. 
So when we want change and, and we want transformation and, and things to be peaceful, that means that we're preaching and teaching this word. We're sharing the word of God with others. We're witnesses. We're called to be ambassadors of Christ, the light of the world, the salt of the earth, to go and preach the gospel to every creature because it's the word of God that's going to bring order. It's the word of God that causes people to walk in obedience and peace with God in right relationship with God. It is the word of God that causes us to be able to overcome our flesh, overcome the world, and overcome the enemy. It is God's word. It's what God says. It's what God desires. When we submit to him, then we can resist the devil and he flees. But not until then. Even in the body of Christ, where there's been pride and haughtiness and division and people doing what they want to do in church, their own programs, their own events, their own things, but not doing the thing God told us to do. Why is the world like this? Because we're not preaching the gospel. People don't want to go outside the four walls of the brick and mortar. People don't want to go out and be the light in the dark world. People don't want to reach out to others. Until God started shutting stuff down, until God started making it so people couldn't go to church the way they were before, then all of a sudden, people still wanted to be relevant. They wanted to be known. They wanted to be not so all of a sudden. Now, somebody wants to give somebody a sandwich. Somebody wants to do this. We got to make sure we have the right heart, that we have the right motive. Remember Cain, he offered an offering, <laughs> but it wasn't acceptable. We have to make sure our heart is right with God, that we desire him, that we delight ourselves in him. That we're doing his will. That we're listening to his word. Because we're in a spiritual battle. And so we need to shut down that flesh. We need to meditate on the word. So our minds are spiritual and not carnal. We need to get this word on the inside. And hide it in our heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaks. And we're made in God's image. So that means as he spoke it was. So as we speak. When we're speaking death. And we're speaking destruction. Those words. That's what's in our heart. That's what we believe. And Jesus tells us in Mark 11. Right? That if we. Whatever we say. If we believe it. That's what we're going to have. So that means that if we're speaking. You, you're speaking over your family. They ain't going to never change. They're not going to get saved. They're always going to be evil. They're just like this person. They're just like their father. That's what you're going to have. You speak in it. But if you have the word of God on the inside and you begin to speak what God says, that it's his desire that none perish, but all come to repentance. He's a very present help in trouble. You know, and we begin to remember that with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. My help coming from the Lord. And we have that word in us. We speak the word and his word is working. And his word does what he sent it to do. And Psalm 107, 20 says he sent his word to heal and to deliver from destruction. So we are going to close out. Listen, you are fighting against the enemy, the flesh, and the world. But guess what? Stay in the word. It's the sword of the spirit. It's your weapon. Put on your armor. Get your weapon. It's a spiritual battle, and it requires spiritual weapons. And the word of God is a great weapon. Amen. We're going to close out in prayer. Don't forget to hit the like button, hit subscribe, and hit the bell. The bell makes you get notifications when I upload videos. Subscribe if it says red, if it's in red underneath, you haven't yet subscribed to the channel. Subscribe to the channel. Join us for morning prayer. Join us for our spiritual warfare class on Wednesday evenings. And be a part of what God is doing in the body of Christ because we have to redeem the time. It is time for believers to rise up in power and authority and the spirit with the word going forth and making an impact in this world. Because the enemy is continuously working and we see destruction. We see it growing. We see the evil and we see the wickedness. It's time for the people of God to arise. The soldiers are being deployed from the brick and mortar building and sent out into the world to preach the gospel, to be a light, to be the salt. Father, in the name of Jesus, we rejoice in you and we bless your name. We honor you. You are the great I am. We thank you for your word, for your truth. We thank you that you are God alone. There is none other. We trust you, God. Help us to be all that you purpose us to be there. We don't make you ashamed, but we bring glory to your name. Father, help us to walk holy. You said for us to be holy because you're holy. Help us, Lord God, Father, that we stand on your word. And I thank you, God, Father, that you have given us a measure of faith. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight. Help our unbelief that in everything that we do, we would be pleasing in your sight. We give you praise, glory, and honor because you are good and your mercy and do a favor. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. To God be the glory. Lord, God bless you. Love you to life. And I'll see you on the next.